This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. One day recently in Brits, South Africa, the curator of a snake and animal park left the cage he had shared with five full-grown crocodiles for 16 days and 16 nights. When the ordeal was over, he was asked by a newspaper reporter why he had done it. And he replied, everyone would like to achieve something that no one else in the world has achieved before. Every person possesses an inherent inner desire to make his or her life count for something. When pioneer space pilot Wally Shira was asked why he decided to become an astronaut, he replied, I guess there's a spirit of pioneering and adventure involved. The early astronaut Scott Carpenter said, I thought this was a chance for immortality. Everyone would like to find some sense of meaning and value in life. The feeling that his or her life has made a difference to the world. This is precisely what faith in God will accomplish. You begin to realize that your life is in contact with a pulsing and purposeful power that the infinite God of this universe has a will, a plan and a purpose for your days on this earth, and that by faith you can discover it. In John Steinbeck's book, Journey of a Novel, he writes, The cosmic ulcer comes not from the great concerns, but from little irritations. One is never drained by work, but only by idleness, Steinbeck writes. Lack of work is the most enervating thing in the world. End of quote. Every person inwardly longs for meaningful achievement, one of the all-time classic practical jokes of the last century was undertaken by an enemy of a man known as the Duke of Epernon. Consisted of a book, 500 pages long, which mysteriously appeared on the market with this title, The Mighty Exploits of the Duke of Epernon. But every last one of those 500 pages was entirely and utterly blank. But suppose that a book were to be written of your life. A book about your great undertakings, your courage, your moral integrity, or a book about your goodness, your faith, your love of your fellow human beings. Would there be that much to tell? The God of this universe has a mighty purpose for your life, and if you seek it, you can and will find it. But one necessity to great living is persistence. Even in the midst of problems and pain, one of the greatest musical geniuses who ever lived, Ludwig van Beethoven, began to lose his sense of hearing halfway through his lifetime, during his late 20s. And for years before he died in 1827, he was totally deaf. Many men and women are utterly unaware of that fact, but consider the agony Beethoven endured as a man who loved and wrote music as few men ever have, yet unable to hear even faintly the touch of his own fingers playing his own compositions on his own piano keyboard. Many a lesser man or woman would have surrendered to bitter despair, but not Beethoven. His greatness was interior, it was a magnitude of spirit, and he continued to compose with a passion even after his hearing was utterly gone. He wrote his immortal, majestic Ninth Symphony in total deafness. He could not hear it played, but he would not give up. And he composed his greatest works in this anguished silence. You, too, are faced with that choice, whether to collapse in despair during your darkest hours or to struggle on in valiant faith as the son or daughter of God you were born and created to be. You possess a certain given amount of energy. The question is, how are you going to use that energy during your lifetime? The Pilgrim Fathers in the 1700s in New England invented a curious device which utilized the action of a rocking chair to work a butter churn and rock a baby's cradle at the same time while a woman sat darning or knitting and rocking in the chair. There is a certain appeal to that for what it symbolizes, the maximum employment of human potential. But no man or woman uses his or her full range of possibilities until he or she begins to recognize the possession not only of material and mental possibilities, but spiritual potentials as well. God has a plan for your life. 
and the discovery of it is an exhilarating process, but it demands patience. One of the most famous poems ever composed, Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard, has 128 lines, but it took Thomas Gray eight years to finish it. And if you calculate it, that's about one line every 23 days. Great art and great lives are seldom instantaneous accomplishments. They require time and persistence. They require faith. The truly great individual is continually in process, constantly changing. A poll taken in San Francisco recently asked the question of passing pedestrians, how would you change yourself? Here were some of the answers. A tour guide said, I wouldn't want to make any physical changes, but I would like to be more sensitive about other people. I'm working on it now. I'd like to be able to like people. I'd like to be able to trust people. A graduate student said, I like myself just as I am. I've changed in the last two years. I'm now capable of enjoying myself by myself. I can enjoy being with other people too, although it's on a more shallow level. An art student said, I wouldn't change anything. Everything I need to change, I can do myself. Just willpower, that's all. There are times I wish I were more relaxed, but in time I'll get to that. I'll change that myself. I'll make all the changes. In response to the question on the street, how would you change yourself? A psychology student said, I'd like to be more at ease, more relaxed, more sure of myself. I am confident, but I'd like to be more self-assured. The changes would be emotional changes. A housewife said, I have a bad temper. I'd like to be more patient. I was a blonde. I just changed to being a brunette. But I like being both. I'd like to be taller, too, about two inches taller. A student said, I get mad too quickly. I have a temper. I wish I didn't. Oh, I know I'd like to have a light complexion, she said. My whole family does. I'm the only one with dark skin. A library employee said, I'd like to be richer, but in all ways. I'd like to have some kind of power, but not political power. Power to influence society instead of society influencing me. Interesting answers. Nearly everyone would like to change. To be human is to be, perhaps, dissatisfied. But how to change? That is the question. How can you be and become what interiorly you long to be and become? You possess the potential for that. But if you're entirely satisfied with the way you are, fear not, you will stay that way. If you have no desire to change, you won't. And yet change is a great excitement of life. Why are children fascinated by looking at a kaleidoscope, holding it up to the light, peering inside, because... It is ever altering its patterns and designs. Change is interesting, however it happens. Whether it's watching a tadpole becoming a frog or witnessing an eclipse of the moon, whether in a science laboratory, in nature, or in other people, or in yourself, change makes life interesting. But by all standards, the most interesting changes are the ones which can take place in your own life, in your mind, your consciousness, your awareness of who and what and why you are, you can awaken to a new sensation of interest and fascination with your daily existence when you begin this transformation in attitude, viewpoint, motivation. By living faith, these most exciting spiritual transformations can and will be yours. You can even become like God, which to some may sound blasphemous. They might say to want to be as God sounds sacrilegious, but the master of all masters himself taught it. Be you perfect, he said, even as your father in heaven is perfect. And that aspiration can totally transform your life. You can not only know about God, but know God personally, individually. You've perhaps heard people say of some extraordinary person, I wish I had his faith. The answer is that you do, if only you would use it. In potential, it is yours already. A man of average physique will look at a photograph of a weightlifter or a professional football player or an Olympic athlete and will say, I wish I had his muscles. The answer is that you do have his muscles. It's an anatomical fact. Any biological scientist will tell you that the scrawniest man on earth has just as many muscles as the most brawny, biceps, bulging, bull moose of a man. It's not a question of acquiring new muscles, but using the ones you already possess, developing, exercising what you possess already. The same it is with faith. You have 
enough faith right now to power your life, to empower your life, if only you would exercise it, if you would utilize it. But what good is a full refrigerator if you won't open the door and eat when you're hungry? What good is a soul full of potential faith if you simply do not use it? It is there if you will, but you must choose to use it. Beginning to live in this sort of faith will not create a trouble-free existence. It may not improve your problems, but it will improve you, and you then, in turn, can cope with your problems more competently. Suppose you're going through your bills and your check stubs, endeavoring to balance your personal financial budget, but you're suffering from a severe headache, and the pain is so annoying you find your thinking distracted. You're unable to concentrate effectively. Curing that headache in and of itself, is not going to add up your checkbook, balance your budget, clear off your work desk for you, but it will enable you to accomplish those things. This is exactly what finding God can bring about in your life, a released ability to solve problems. Faith may not make your difficulties go away, but it can make you strong enough to make your difficulties go away. God is not going to throw a thunderbolt at this world and change it without your effort and without mine. The way of God is not to make the world new, but to make people new, and renewed people can and will create a transformed world. Living as kin to the Creator, your faith and enthusiasm can be so stirred, your mind so electrified by enthusiasm and high-voltage hope that first you and then this very world itself will be transformed. Seek, said the master, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. Ask, and you will receive. And then write to us, will you, at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute. The mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. We want to hear from you. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer. All this literature, yours free, no cost, charge, or obligation. When you write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.